found in John 21, verses 15 through 19, from page 1137 in the Pew When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, you truly love me more than these. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, you truly love me. He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God.
And we are at post-resurrection time, and Jesus is making his third appearance to his disciples. Our specific text is explicitly linked to the preceding scene where Jesus sees some of the disciples have been fishing all night with no success. So we'll go to, a little back up a little bit in John 21, chapter 2. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Zip. Zero zilch. That was mine. Edition. Uh, but when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Friends or children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. Okay, let's look at the scene here where Sea of Galilee, and I can just imagine these disciples all night. It even says in the text that Peter stripped down to the waist, took his shirt off. They were working so hard, kind of get their minds, it's been an intense time for them. Of course, after the death, burial, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of their, their rabbi, their follower, the Savior. And so they just went out to go fishing. And so they're out there to fish all night, hard, hard, hard. Nothing. Get nothing. And then here's someone on the shore. They don't know it's Jesus. Someone yells at them, hey, hey, try the other side. Try the other side. Well, I'm sorry. If I was in the boat, I'd be like, duh. I mean, yeah, we've been here all night. So here's the guy giving advice from the shore. But yes, they do. They throw the net off the boat on the other side, and it fills up. And what do we read? Then John said to Peter, it is the Lord. Next thing you know, Peter puts his shirt on again. Thank you, Peter. And leaps into the water. Oh, Peter. Now let's briefly talk about this disciple, Simon Peter. Some words to describe him are brash, impulsive. He often spoke without thinking. He was slow. Remember last week, John beat him to the empty tomb. So we know, you know, he wasn't fleet of foot. <laughs> anyway, he was slower than John. Even later on, he found it hard to treat Gentile Christians as equals. He and Thomas, doubting Thomas as we would come to know him, remind me of a story I once heard. Two men were getting ready to tee off one beautiful Florida morning. And the one says to the other, have you heard about Alexander? He embezzled half a million dollars from his company. The other man said, that's terrible. I never did trust Alexander. The first man continued, not only that, he left town and took Hank's wife with him. The other man replied, that's awful. Alexander has always been a sneaky guy. The first man continued saying, not only that, he stole a car to make his getaway. The other man said, that's scandalous. I always did think Alexander had a bad streak in him. The first man finally concluded, not only that, they think he was drunk when he pulled out of town. The other man said, Alexander's just no good. After a few moments of reflection, he then asked, but what really bothers me is this. Who's going to teach his Sunday school class this week? Ooh, ouch. Integrity requires an ongoing supply of character and a steady flow of trustworthiness. Simon Peter struggled with these issues of integrity and trustworthiness in his life. In the text of scripture we are looking at today, we see a disciple that has an integrity issue. The fishermen, disciples of Jesus, had just finished breakfast or were reclining after a full meal. You just see them. They're on the beach. They've had a big meal. The, the, in verse 11, it even says they caught 153 fish. Now, I'm not sure they were eating all 153. That was a big task. But we know they had a full meal. They had a big breakfast. So they were relaxed. They were engaged around a fire. When Jesus engages Simon Peter, son of John, with these questions, do you love me? And he asked that three times. The first question he adds, more than these, referring to the other disciples here. This interested in, interestingly enough, equaled the same number of times just days before that Peter had denied Christ. Remember that back in John 13? Jesus himself predicted that John, that Peter, 
would deny him. And then verse 18, we see 17 and 25 to 27, that he does it one after the other. And then the third time, the rooster crows, and he was convicted. He knew it. Ooh. In the original Greek, Jesus uses two different forms of to love here. Agape and phileo. Agape in questions one and two, and phileo in the third question. And all of Peter's replies are the same. They're all the same phileo term. Now as a refresher, agape, also the same Greek word, found in one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3.16, is translated, is best translated as divine love, and usually carries the connotation of will or purpose, as well as that of affection. Phileo, on the other hand, implies an affinity, a friendship, or fondness for someone else. Hence where we get our city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And Rocky, too. But anyway. Both words represent a high aspect of love. Both were used of God and of humans in the book of John. Ken Baker writes on this exchange between Jesus and Peter, a good case can be made for a difference in Jesus' emphasis. There was less doubt concerning Peter's attachment to Jesus than there was concerning his will to love at all costs. And the change of term in Jesus' third question makes his probing of Peter even deeper. Peter's affirmative answer to each question is substantially the same. The verb translated no, used in the first two responses, is a word that implies the intellectual knowledge of a fact. In his third reply, however, Peter strengthened his statement by a word that denotes knowledge gained through experience. Jesus' commands to Peter also contain fine distinctions. His first one, feed or pasture my lambs, found in verse 15. Secondly, he commands Peter, take care of, shepherd my sheep, in verse 16. And thirdly, feed, pasture my sheep, verse 17. Now the first and third imply just taking care, just taking sheep to pasture. But the second implies the total guardianship a shepherd exercises over a sheep. Now don't think that these injunctions give only Peter the sole responsibility by, for oversight over Christ's followers. According to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, all spiritually mature disciples are called to be shepherds to one extent or another. This challenge to Peter specifically demanded a total renewal of his loyalty and reaffirmed his responsibilities. It can also be said that the reason for this narrative was for the Lord to reinforce that he still loved Peter and had not cast him out. Jesus' words in verses 18 and 19 to Peter predicted his future career. Peter would have a new responsibility, a new danger, and a violent death. Jesus even placed Peter in a category with himself when he said, by what kind of death he would glorify God, a life spent for God and ultimately sacrificed to glorify God. Then his command, follow me which literally means, keep on following me. Jesus showed Peter that if he were to fulfill his promise of loyalty, he would have to follow him to his own cross. And historically, that's how Peter died, crucified upside down because he did not want to die the same death of his Savior. Jesus' first words to Simon Peter were, come follow me, found in Mark chapter 1, verse 17. And his last words to him, recorded in Scripture, were, You must follow me. In John 21, 22. Now I heard it said, when Jesus chose his followers, he wasn't looking for models. He was looking for real people like you and me. He chose people who could be changed by his love. And then sent them out to, the, to communicate that his acceptance was available to everyone. To everyone. Yes, even to those who often fail. We may wonder what Jesus sees in us when he calls you and I to follow him. But we know from his word that Jesus accepted Peter in spite of his faults and failures. And Peter went on to do great things for God. Are you and I willing to keep following Jesus 
even when we fail? I pray we respond like Peter in his third response. Yes, Lord. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. So three expect expectations or takeaways from this text. When you really start, when you dedicate your life to Christ and follow on Him. First, expect some, some changes to come into your life. Characteristics, poor habits, etc. to change. We sing the hymn, Just As I Am. But after you come to Christ and Jesus and start following Him, and are born again and follow Him, not the ways of the world anymore, you better continue. You better not continue staying just as you are. You ought to start conforming to the image of Christ. Secondly, expect to wonder, question, or even doubt how we are unworthy of God's grace. I read again recently the story of Billy Graham and his tree stump prayer in the late 1940s when he overcame doubt. Some Beverly Atkins here. Then he went on to hold the 1949 Los Angeles Crusade. It was originally scheduled to only last three weeks, but it went on for eight. Eventually, he went on to preach the gospel to more people around the world than anyone ever lived. Yes, Billy Graham even doubted, but God saw him through it, and his faith was strengthened all the more through God's word, and he did amazing things. Finally, expect your circle of friends and family to either get tighter or break away. The other disciples would have known of Peter's denial, but Jesus speaking these words to Peter, in a way, reinstated him among the group. Finally, I want to share an email I received from my friend overseas, and it goes like this. Yesterday, I sat with my Afghan friend for a long time. He started professing faith in Christ last summer. His dad was found, has found out and is demanding that he return to Kabul immediately. It was, <clears throat> excuse me, it has been hard, it has been a hard month for him. We talked about, about him honoring his parents and a possible path forward. We prayed and asked God to help. This young man asked me, if my dad rejects my plan and insists I come home, what do I do? My friend responded, I think God would want you to honor your father. The young man quietly said, I will need to pray about, pray about that. And then he said quietly, I am ready to talk. 